Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Chapter 29. In the summer of that same year, Johnny got the notion that his children were growing up ignorant of the great ocean that washed the shores of Brooklyn. Johnny felt that they ought to go out to sea in his ship, so he decided to take them for a rowboat ride at Carnacy and do a little deep sea fishing on the side. He had never gone fishing, and he had never been in a rowboat, but that's the idea he got. Weirdly tied up with this idea, and by a reasoning process known only to Johnny, was the idea of taking little Tilly along on the trip. Little Tilly was the four-year-old child of neighbors whom he had never met. In fact, he had never seen little Tilly. But he got this idea that he had to make something up to her on account of her brother Gussie. It all tied up with the notion of going to Carnacy. Gussie, a boy of six, was a murky legend in the neighborhood. A tough little hellion with an overdeveloped underlip. He had been born like other babies and nursed at his mother's great breasts. But there, all resemblance to any child living or dead ceased. His mother tried to wean him when he was nine months old, but Gussie wouldn't stand for it. Denied the breast, he refused the bottle. Food or water. He lay in his crib and whimpered. His mother, fearful that he would starve, resumed nursing him. He sucked contentedly, refusing all other food, and lived off his mother's milk until he was nearly two years old. The milk stopped then because his mother was with child again. Gussie sulked and bided his time for nine long months. He refused cow's milk in any form or container and took to drinking black coffee. Little Tilly was born and the mother flowed with milk again. Gussie went into hysterics the first time he saw the baby nursing. He lay on the floor screaming and banging his head. He wouldn't eat for four days and he refused to go to the toilet. He got haggard and his mother got frightened. She thought it wouldn't do him any harm to give him the breast just once. That was her big mistake. He was like a dope fiend getting the stuff after a long period of deprivation. He wouldn't let go. He took all of his mother's milk from that time on and little Tilly, a sickly baby, had to go on the bottle. Gussie was three years old at this time and big for his age. Like other boys, he wore knee pants and heavy shoes with brass toe tips. As soon as he saw his mother unbutton her dress, he ran to her. He stood up while nursing, an elbow on his mother's knee, his feet crossed jauntily and his eyes roving around the room. Standing to nurse was not such a remarkable feat as his mother's great breasts were mountainous and practically rested in her lap when released. Gussie was indeed a fearful sight. Nursing that way, he looked not unlike a man with a foot on a bar rail smoking a fat, pale cigar. Neighbors found out about Gussie and discussed his pathological state in hushed whispers. Gussie's father got so he wouldn't sleep with his wife. He said that she bred monsters. The poor woman figured and figured on a way to wean Gussie. He was too big to nurse, she decided. He was going on four. She was afraid his second teeth wouldn't come in straight. One day she took a can of stove blackening and the brush and closed herself in the bedroom where she copiously blackened her left breast with stove polish. With a lipstick, she drew a wide, ugly mouth with frightening teeth in the vicinity of the nipple. She buttoned her dress and went into the kitchen and sat in her nursing rocker near the window. When Gussie saw her, he threw the dice with which he had been playing under the wash tubs and trotted over for feeding. He crossed his feet, planted his elbow on her knee, and waited. Gussie want titty? asked his mother wheedlingly. Yep. All right. Gussie's going to get nice titty. Suddenly she ripped open her dress, thrust the horribly made up breast into his face. Gussie was paralyzed with fright for a moment. Then he ran away screaming and hid under the bed where he stayed for 24 hours. He came out at last, trembling. He went back to drinking black coffee and shuddered every time his eyes went to his mother's bosom. Gussie was weaned. The mother reported her success all over the neighborhood. It started a new fashion in weaning called giving the baby the Gussie. Johnny heard the story and contemptuously dismissed Gussie from his mind. He was concerned about little Tilly. He thought she had been cheated out of something very important and might grow up thwarted. He got a notion that a boat ride off a Carnacy shore might wipe out some of the wrong her unnatural brother had done to her. He sent Francie around to ask, could little Tilly go with them? The harassed mother consented happily. Next Sunday, Johnny and the three children set out for Carnacy. 
Francie was 11 years old, Neely 10, and little Tilly well past three. Johnny wore his tuxedo and derby and fresh collar and dicky. Francie and Neely wore their everyday clothes. Little Tilly's mother, in honor of the day, had dressed her up in a cheap but fancy lace dress trimmed with dark pink ribbon. On the trolley ride, they sat in the front seat and Johnny made friends with the motorman and they talked politics. They got off at the last stop, which was Carnacy, and found their way to a little wharf on which was a tiny shack. A couple of waterlogged rowboats bobbed up and down on the frayed ropes, which held them to the wharf. A sign over the shack read, Fishing Tackle and Boats for Rent. Underneath was a bigger sign which read, Fresh Fish to Take Home for Sale Here. Johnny negotiated with the man, and as was his way, made a friend of him. The man invited him into the shack for an eye-opener, saying that he himself had only just used the stuff for a nightcap. While Johnny was inside getting his eyes opened, Neely and Francie pondered how a nightcap could also be an eye-opener. Little Tilly stood there in her lace dress and said nothing. Johnny came out with a fishing pole and a rusty tin can filled with worms and mud. The friendly man untied the rope from the least sorry of the rowboats, put the rope in Johnny's hand, wished him luck, and went back to his shack. Johnny put the fishing stuff in the bottom of the boat and helped the children in. Then he crouched on the wharf, the bit of rope in his hand, and gave instructions about boats. There's always a wrong and a right way to, to get on a boat, said Johnny, who had never been on any boat except the excursion boat once. The right way is to give the boat a shove and then jump in it before it drifts out to sea, like this. He straightened up, pushed the boat from him, leaped, and fell into the water. The petrified children stared at him. A second before Papa had been standing on the dock above them, now he was below them in the water. The water came to his neck, and his small waxed mustache and derby hat were in the clear. His derby was still straight on his forehead. Johnny was as surprised as the children, stared at them a moment before he said, Don't any of you damn kids dare to laugh. He climbed into the boat, almost upsetting it. They didn't dare laugh aloud, but Francie laughed so hard inside that her ribs hurt. Neely was afraid to look at his sister. He knew that if their eyes met, he'd burst out laughing. Little Tilly said nothing. Johnny's collar and Dickie were a sodden, paperish mess. He stripped them off and threw them overboard. He rowed out to sea waveringly, but with silent dignity. When he came to what he thought was a likely spot, he announced he was going to drop anchor. The children were disappointed when they discovered that the romantic phrase simply meant that you threw a lump of iron attached to a rope overboard. Horrified, they watched Papa squeamishly impale a muddy worm on the hook. The fishing started. It consisted in baiting the hook, casting it dramatically, waiting a while, pulling it in minus the worm and fish, and starting the whole thing over again. The sun grew bright and hot. Johnny's tuxedo dried to a stiff, wrinkled, greenish outfit. The children started to get a whopping case of sunburn. After what seemed hours, Papa announced to their intense relief and happiness that it was time to eat. He wound up the tackle, put it away, pulled up the anchor, and made for the wharf. The boat seemed to go in a circle, which made the wharf get further away. Finally, they made shore a few hundred yards further down. Johnny tied up the boat, told the children to wait in it, and went ashore. He said he was going to treat them to a nice lunch. He came back after a while walking sideways, carrying hot dogs, huckleberry pie, and strawberry pop. They sat in the rocking boat tied to the rotting wharf, looked down into the slimy green water that smelled of decaying fish, and ate. Johnny had had a few drinks ashore, which made him sorry that he had hollered at the kids. He told them they could laugh at his falling into the water if they wanted to, but somehow they couldn't bring up a laugh. The time was past for that. Papa was very cheerful, Francie thought. This is the life, he said, away from the maddening crowd. Ah, oh, there's nothing like going down to the sea in a ship. We're getting away from it all, he ended up cryptically. After their amazing lunch, Johnny rode them out to sea again. Perspiration poured down from under his derby, and the wax in the points of his mustache melted, causing the neat adornment to change into disorganized hair on his upper lip. He felt fine. He sang lustily as he rode, Sailing, sailing over the bounding main, 
He rode and rode and kept rowing around in a circle and never did get out to sea. Eventually, his hands got so blistered that he didn't feel like rowing anymore. Dramatically, he announced he was going to pull for the shore. He pulled and pulled and finally made it by rowing in smaller and smaller circles and making the circles come near the wharf. He never noticed that the three children were pea green in the spots where they were not beet red from sunburn. If he had only known it, the hot dogs, huckleberry pie, strawberry pop, and worms squirming on the hook weren't doing them much good. At the wharf, he leapt to the dock and the children followed his example. All made it excepting Tilly, who fell into the water. Johnny threw himself flat on the dock, reached in and fished her out. Little Tilly stood there, her lace dress wet and ruined, but she said nothing. Although it was a broiling hot day, Johnny peeled off his tuxedo jacket, knelt down and wrapped it around the child. The arms dragged in the sand. Johnny took her up in his arms and strode up and down the dock, patting her back soothingly and singing her a lullaby. Little Tilly didn't understand a thing of all that happened that day. She didn't understand why she had been put into a boat, why she had fallen into the water, or why the man was making such a fuss over her. She said nothing. When Johnny felt that she was comforted, he set her down and went into the shack where he had either an eye opener or a nightcap. He bought three flounders from the man for a quarter. He came out with the wet fish wrapped in a newspaper. He told his children that he had promised to bring home some freshly caught fish to Mama. The principal thing, said Papa, is that I'm bringing home fish that were caught at Carnacy. It makes no difference who caught them. The point is that we went fishing and we're bringing home fish. His children knew that he wanted Mama to think he caught the fish. Papa didn't ask them to lie. He just asked them not to be too fussy about the truth. The children understood. They boarded one of those trolley cars that had two long benches facing each other. They made a queer row. First there was Johnny in green wrinkled salt stiff pants and an undershirt full of big holes, a derby hat and a disorderly mustache. Next came little Tilly swallowed up in the coat with salt water dripping from under it and forming a brackish pool on the floor. Francie and Neely came next. Their faces brick red and they sat very rigid trying not to be sick. People got on the car, sat across from them, and stared curiously. Johnny sat upright, the fish in his lap, trying not to think of the holes in his exposed undershirt. He looked over the heads of the passengers, pretending to study the x lax advertisement. More people got on. The car got crowded, but no one would sit next to them. Finally, one of the fish worked its way out of the sodden newspaper and fell to the floor, where it lay slimily in the dust. It was too much for little Tilly. She looked into the fish's glazed eyes, said nothing, but vomited silently and thoroughly all over Johnny's tuxedo jacket. Francie and Neely, as if waiting for that cue, also threw up. Johnny sat there with two exposed fish in his lap, one at his feet, and kept staring at the ad. He didn't know what else to do. When the grisly trip ended, Johnny took Tilly home, feeling his was the responsibility of explaining. The mother never gave him a chance to explain. She screamed when she saw her dripping, befouled child. She snatched the coat off, threw it in Johnny's face, and called him a Jack the Ripper. Johnny tried and tried to explain, but she wouldn't listen. Little Tilly said nothing. Finally, Johnny got in a word edgewise. Lady, I think your little girl has lost her speech. Whereupon the mother went into hysterics. You did it! You did it! She screamed at Johnny. Can't you make her say something? The mother grabbed the child and shook her and shook her. Speak! She screamed. Say something! Finally, little Tilly opened her mouth, smiled happily, and said, Thanks! Katie gave Johnny a tongue lashing and said that he wasn't fit to have children. The children in question were alternating between chills and hot flashes of a bad case of sunburn. Katie nearly cried when she saw the ruin of Johnny's only suit. It would cost her a dollar to get it clean, steamed and pressed, and she knew it would never be the same again. As for the fish, they were found to be in an advanced state of decay and had to be thrown into the garbage can. The children went to bed. Between chills and fever and bouts of nausea, they buried their head under the covers and laughed silently and bed shakingly at the remembrance of Papa standing in the water. Johnny sat at the kitchen window until far into the night, trying to figure out why everything had been so wrong. He had sung many a song about ships and going down to the sea in them with a heave-ho and a heave-too. 
He wondered why it hadn't turned out the way it said in songs. The children should have returned exhilarated with a deep and abiding love for the sea, and he should have returned with a fine mess of fish. Why, oh why, hadn't it turned out the way it did in song? Why did there have to be his blistered hands, his spoilt suit and sunburn, and rotting fish and nausea? Why didn't little Tilly's mother understand the intention and overlook the result? He couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure it out. The songs of the sea had betrayed him.